you're very welcome to this presentation. Um, so my presentation is entitled Corporate Taxation and Firm Level Investment in South Africa. This is one of my uh, chapters in the PhD that broadly looks at uh, uh, corporate tax policy and, uh, and investment outcomes uh, in South Africa. Okay, so by way of, uh, um, you know, uh, overview, this is basically how the presentation is structured. Um, I'll, I'll give the background to the study and then the main objective of the study. Then I'll very briefly present the theoretical and empirical review. And then I'll uh, explain the concept of the user cost of capital, the, the main uh, concept through which corporate tax um, affects investment in the context of neoclassical models. And then I'll talk about the corporate tax reforms in South Africa, then the data and the descriptive statistics will be presented and I'll very briefly present the estimation, uh, the estimating equation, then go straight into the main results. And uh, finally, we'll draw some policy implications and conclusions arising from the findings in the paper. All right. Um, so, no, no topic within the field of, uh, you know, public economics has received so much uh, attention and um, has had so much debate as the, you know, the, the, the subfield of corporate tax and investment. Um, there's been many uh, uh, theories, many views on just what, uh, you know, impacts or what determines investment. Uh, the traditional theories of uh, investment, in particular the neoclassical investment theories of Jurgenson, generally predict that uh, the long run impact of uh, corporate tax changes that work through the user cost of capital that I'll, you know, define very shortly, are generally around uh, minus one. Um, so the user cost of capital coefficient is believed to be generally around uh, uh, negative one. But this link uh, has been quite contentious uh, in the literature. Some studies do find support for this hypothesis, while um, an increasingly large number of studies, especially from developing countries, tend to dispute this uh, hypothesis. Um, recently, there's been some studies uh, conducted in South Africa and uh, in countries like Slovenia that actually find, uh, you know, that corporate tax does not actually have an impact on investment uh, determination using firm level data. Um, in terms of the, the landscape of the, the literature, most of the studies are, however, very much concentrated in uh, developed countries, particularly the U.S., uh, that's where, you know, 60% of the literature is actually concentrated. There's a few studies in the, in the, in the UK and as well as Germany. And um, this gap in the literature in terms of geographical coverage is actually something that uh, Bond and Jing actually pointed out in their paper, uh, uh, 2015 paper, where they were looking at the, the impact of corporate taxes and, uh, and on investments in the U.S. Uh, this is quite surprising uh, because, as we all know, there's been a lot of reforms, especially across sub-Saharan Africa, uh, beginning around the 1990s. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of reforms aimed at trying to attract investment from Western countries so that, uh, you know, if, uh, prospects like, uh, you know, employment uh, could be improved. Um, in South Africa itself, there's been substantial reforms, especially around the 1990s, just after the democratic transition there, there was a lot of uh, significant reforms, uh, particularly those around uh, commissioned by the CAS Commission of, uh, on tax reforms. Uh, there's been um, uh, so many reforms and uh, such significant reforms since the 1990s, but then, um, Despite all these reforms, there has not been uh, any effort or any attempt by researchers to just look at the impact of these reforms on investment. And this is not for lack of uh, trying, it's basically because of uh, lack of data. 
So uh, in terms of sub-Sahara in general, there's very little data that one can use to assess the effects of corporate tax changes on firm level investment. Uh, firstly, even existing tax records, uh, you know, don't have uh, a large enough coverage, you know, in terms of the years, most of the uh, company records have only really been digitized uh, in the recent past. So uh, most of the available records actually do not extend back to the, to the 90s when these reforms were available. Most, uh, even in South Africa, you know, the, the firm level data that is actually currently there in, in a usable form only really starts from 2007, uh, thereabout, and doesn't stretch back far enough to the 90s to, you know, pick up some of those, uh, uh, some of the likely impacts of corporate tax uh, reforms on investments. Um, the other reason is even with uh, private repositories, like uh, what I use in this data, the, the Thomson Reuters data stream uh, data, in other countries, it's actually very uh, limited because the stock exchanges in other countries are very small. Uh, so talking about, uh, you know, like Zambia, there's probably just around, uh, you know, 20, 30 listed companies that could have consistent data over a long enough period of time. And you all agree with me that, that such a sample size is not sufficient enough you know, to, uh, to get consistent uh, estimates. Um, my study therefore uh, you know, explores the domestic stock exchange data uh, for the case of South Africa, because the South African case has relatively better data. Uh, you know, from uh, uh, the data stream uh, um, subscription service. Um, when I explored uh, the data set, I found that South Africa does actually have uh, a, a significantly richer data set of firms followed consistent over a period that at least spans some of the you know, reforms that South Africa has undertaken uh, over the last uh, two decades or so. Um, so this study um, basically explores the relationship between corporate tax and investments using uh, an autoregressive distributed lag model of investment. And I exploit firm level data over the period 1999 to, to 2012. I would have loved to uh, extend you know, as, as far back as the mid 1990s, but data couldn't allow me uh, you know, uh, I could really only find useful data from 1999. All right, so the main uh, objective of this uh, study is to determine the responsiveness of firm level investment to corporate tax changes using the Jorgensen investment framework. So the Jorgensen investment framework is really the canonical invest the model of investment that uh, you know, it has been presented in the corporate tax literature. Here is my uh, theoretical review. There are a number of uh, theories that have attempted to explain uh, investment uh, determination. Um, the very, you know, first model in terms of significance is uh, the, the neoclassical investment model by Jorgensen. It's actually theoretically founded in the you know, uh, the profit maximizing uh, behavior of the firm. Uh, and uh, at the heart of this model is really this idea that, uh, you know, firms always strive to achieve an optimal level of capital investment. And so one can look at investment as a process of uh, reaching that particular optimum. So if uh, actual investment is below the, an op the given optimum investment, a firm is likely to actually invest. And if it's, uh, uh, you know, way above the optimum level, a firm will uh, divest or reduce its level of investment. So the idea is to keep this optimum level of investment. And that, that's, that's the, the, the heart of this particular model. Um, and Jorgensen does some, comes up with some very interesting results where he basically says investment 
is really just a function of uh, aggregate demand for sales or output, as well as the user cost of capital. I'll define what this concept is uh, in the next few slides. Following the early success of the neoclassical investment model, uh, criticisms were actually raised by uh, Tobins and Abel, uh, who came up with uh, you know, a structurally founded uh, theoretical models of investment. Their main criticism was that the neoclassical model was not uh, very strongly founded in theory, uh, you know, because it had uh, a, a reduced form characterization of the investment process, whereas uh, Tobins and Abel uh, actually derived uh, you know, this, their investment models explicitly from their, you know, uh, profit maximizing behavior of the firm. All right, so we do have in the literature, some studies that use the Tobin's cube, others use the Euler and so on. These are very strong competing models um, together with the neoclassical investment model. So let me just say since the sixties, the use of the neoclassical investment model has actually increased and uh, is, is still you know, a significant model. And um, in parallel, we also do have papers that have developed quite strongly that use the Tobin's Q as well as the Euler models. However, it's generally observed that in empirical applications, the Tobin's and the Euler models perform quite poorly compared to the neoclassical uh, model of Jurgensen. And this, you know, in the 1980s, you know, brought about further competing theories, uh, what I classify as contemporary theories of investment. We, we've got many of them, but I just highlight a few here. We've got the financial constraints model, which basically says, uh, criticizes the neoclassical investment model and says, you know, in the presence of uh, imperfect markets, uh, neoclassical fundamentals such as uh, aggregate demand, uh, and in particular, the user cost of capital may no longer be the key determinants of investment, but rather availability of internal finance at the firm level would determine the you know, investment outcomes. And so there is you know, studies that have followed this, uh, this line of thought. And as a matter of fact, in one of my papers in the, in the thesis, I actually explore to what extent financial constraints affect uh, firm level investment in South Africa. Then much more recently, there's been the institution of views popularized by uh, uh, Dollar, as well as Douglas North, you know, where basically the argument is that institutions are very important and they do matter for investments. Uh, um, I like this quote, you know, in the paper by Dollar, it actually says investment climate is like the link between sowing and reaping. Yeah. So to them, what really determines or what is really important for investment is just the, you know, the quality of the investment climate, the quality of the, you know, the institutions, uh, because, the, you know, investment climate and the institutions, uh, they believe these are very, very uh, important because they, they guarantee you know, property rights. They, 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 they guarantee that the rules of you know, the engagement, the rules and regulations of transactions are respected. That helps with planning and so on. So this view is actually quite, quite strong. And there's literature that a lot of literature has come up particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where there's a lot of papers from the African Development Bank, uh, World, uh, World Bank supported papers that look at uh, the different aspects of uh, investment climate, you know, like corruption, availability of infrastructure, physical infrastructure, as well as financial infrastructure. In, fa if, in fact, even including uh, human uh, capital, you know? So there's this, this competing view and there's a lot of uh, literature that's actually, you know, come up. So there's, uh, in a nutshell, there's a lot of theories that can explain, um, you know, uh, investment as to which one is better than the other is really an empirical question. Uh, in this paper, I chose to use the, you know, the canonical neoclassical investment model of Jurgensen, uh, firstly, because of the nature of the data and also the nature of the question I ask. Uh, the question is, 
um, again, the question is, you know, have all these uh, corporate tax reforms that we've seen over the years been instrumental in, you know, increasing investments in South Africa? In other words, does corporate tax matter for increasing corporate uh, investments at the firm level? Um, so I chose to use the neoclassical investment model because it's the one that's best suited for the question at hand. Um, because of time constraints, I will not spend so much time on the empirical uh, review. There is an extensive uh, review of the empirical literature in the, in the paper that I'm presenting. It's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a working paper and it's available online. But broadly, the picture that emerges when one does a, a review of this literature is that a lot of the um, evidence is actually concentrated in developed countries. And the findings from that literature is that um, corporate tax does actually you know, impact investment. Yeah, though there are some exceptions there are some papers that have found that, um, you know, even though corporate tax does, uh, you know, impact investment, there is this uh, expected relationship. The coefficient is actually not uh, equal to one as predicted by Jorgensen. It's, it, it's something that is less than one, you know, in most, some cases could be 0 0.4 and so on. So most studies find that, uh, while most studies do find a negative coefficient, a coefficient of negative one on the user cost of capital a parameter, they, there are some studies that actually have found coefficient estimates that are below this uh, theoretically predicted uh, uh, coefficient size of minus one. And uh, there are some very, very few in developed countries like, uh, like Jagan who actually finds a zero coefficient. But in general, in advanced countries, the papers that use the neoclassical investment model do find uh, the expected relationship between corporate tax uh, uh, policy as, and investment. In developing countries, however, the general picture really is that there are no studies generally. There, there are no studies, there's very little empirical literature uh, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, that you know explores this relationship using the neoclassical investment model. Existing studies, such as uh, this same one I'm presenting, and another study which was conducted by the World Bank in uh, 2016, find the user cost of capital to to act to be zero. In other words, the studies find that there is no significant effect of corporate tax changes on um, on investments. Okay, so we now move on to the, you know, the, the, the concept of the user cost of capital. So the user cost of capital is really, uh, you know, the, the parameter through which traditionally uh, investment, the effects of corporate tax have been on investment have been analyzed. So technically, the use of, this is a tax adjusted user cost of capital. Um, and um, the definition really is just that this is the minimum return a firm needs on a marginal investment in order to cover uh, the cost of operation, such as uh, depreciation taxes, as well as the interest rates or the opportunity cost of investment. Okay, so uh, it's really a, a, a comprehensive measure because it does capture not only the firm level uh, determinants, but, in, it does, but also captures the macro level determinants of investment. Um, so the way the user cost of capital is formulated in this study is uh, as presented in, this, in the next slide here. Uh, so it's basically just a function largely of the tax parameters. Um, tau there is a tax. Uh, ZS there is just the, the present value of the accumulated uh, you know, depreciation and all the other tax allowances. And then um, the other components, really, I will not spell out everything here. I'll just focus on the main components. Uh, you know, you've got the 
the cost of debt as well as the cost of equity. These are just the interest rates. They are weighted differently depending on the, 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 the portfolio of, uh, of uh, liabilities uh, on the company's uh, financial statements. And uh, we've got also a, you know, price series. They are important. And uh, lastly, we've got depreciation. All right, so I collect these uh, inputs from uh, various sources. So the price series uh, come from SARS, for instance, the actual um, um, you know, present value depreciation allowances do come from a study conducted by the World Bank. Um, the tax rates are obviously in the tax laws. And then um, most of the components in the square brackets here do come from the JobX stock exchange financial statement data, the company data that I'll explain shortly. Uh, there are many formulations of the use of cost of capital, but the one I use here is the more recent one, or should I say the most recent one by uh, Chatelain. So this one um, is most suitable for use when one has financial statement data because financial statement data tends to aggregate, um, it tends to aggregate you know, assets. So when you look at the financial statements, you typically don't have the values of let's say property you know, uh, and uh, the values of maybe equipment separately, all you have is just fixed assets and you've got a one value. So for that, we, 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 the best uh, formulation or the best formula to use is um, the one presented in this slide. There are other uh, you know, uh, formulas like the King and Fullerton. These are used in a different paper that I did and not necessarily this particular paper. Okay. Um, I'll very quickly go over the the, the most significant corporate tax reforms that have happened in South Africa. So generally after the democratic transition, a, a number of tax reforms were implemented to you know, attract uh, foreign investments and address the pressing problems of uh, you know, unemployment, poverty and inequality. Some of these reforms include very uh, steep reductions, very large reductions in the headline corporate tax rates particularly just after the democratic uh, transition in 1994. Um, the, the corporate tax rate was quite high before 1994, uh, but then was very much significantly reduced over the like, following three to four years. Unfortunately, I don't capture those, some of those because of the data limitation I mentioned. You'll recall that my data starts somewhere from 1999. And I would have really liked to you know, start this analysis from even around 1992. You know, but uh, you know, I, I couldn't go as far back as that particular point. But I still do capture some of these uh, variations in corporate tax policy. I do capture reductions in the headline corporate tax rates because these actually continued even until 2007, I think. Um, I also do capture some uh, generous uh, depreciation allowances. Uh, that were introduced actually in 2001 to 2002 in the manufacturing sectors, as well as the 100% expensing of, uh, you know, uh, depreciation expensing for new machinery in mining. There is also reductions in the secondary tax rate and its uh, eventual elimination uh, in 2012. So these are just some of the uh, corporate tax reforms that actually inform our, the variation in our study. All right, there are some incentives that I couldn't capture uh, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s actually. There is the government introduced the, the I-12 tax allowance investment scheme. I, I actually do not capture that because uh, some of the allowances or incentives in that package like cash grants, the investment allowances themselves are not captured in the financial statements. So the financial statements don't capture everything. Uh, so it's difficult to see to what extent firms on the job ex stock exchange benefited from some of these reforms. Uh, but I do capture the main uh, 
uh, reforms, the headline reforms that I, I mentioned on the previous slide. All right, so the data basically just comes from a data stream. Um, this is a, a Thomson Reuters a, a data service. You see it does have a subscription. And I looked at balance sheet and income statements for about 196 firms over the period 1999 to 2000. Uh, this data, however, is not obviously representative of South African firms because only the largest firms you know, are listed on the Jobex Stock Exchange, even by, uh, by, by definition. So to, to satisfy certain listing requirements, a firm needs to be so big, right? So this study doesn't really represent or is not representative of um, all the uh, of the you know the, the firms, the population of firms in South Africa. However, it's still it's well suited for this study or the main objectives of this study because larger firms are actually the ones that would be more responsive to changes in corporate tax policy. Firms that are small typically do not, you know, um, don't even pay taxes. They don't uh, qualify for certain uh, corporate tax incentives and so on. And not only that, the job stock exchange data, at least as far as I know, is the most, offers the most comprehensive, um, you know, uh, panel, the data set of firms. There are other, uh, you know, panels of firms, which also includes more firms, but these do not, uh, you know, cover a long enough period of time. And then um, because of, uh, you know, requirements like, well, to be listed, you need to observe certain regulations, you need to have clean uh, and audited financial statements. So I, I firmly believe that the quality of the balance sheet that I'm looking at, as well as the income statements has been verified by independent uh, auditors and, and assessors. So this gives us a relatively better quality than uh, other surveys that might have been collected by individual researchers. So I believe this makes uh, this particular data set uh, suited for the objectives or for the purposes of this study. I'll quickly look, go to, to the sample. So very broadly, um, uh, you know, we're looking at a total of 196 firms, uh, which make up uh, 2,129 uh, firm year observations and the distribution of the, the firms is presented in this table. So we have about uh, uh, seven sectors, okay? And then in, because we are dealing with panel data, I thought it would be great to present the, you know, the number of spells as well. So this basically tells you the number of, uh, of firms that have a certain number of continuous years of data. So for instance, 15 firms in this sample have about uh, at least uh, have uh, five spells of data, okay? And then 77 or almost 40% of the sample are observed in each year, all right? So this is basically to just uh, give us a picture of the, the dynamics of the data. And then uh, the descriptive statistics. Um, I will not again go through everything here. Uh, my, I'll just highlight that uh, you know the average uh, investment level is about uh, uh, three. Is it three? Yeah, this is about uh, three point three billion. Uh, so these are annual figures, and then this is the investment rate, but. Uh, uh, 33% or so. And these are the growth rates for sales as well as for the user cost of capital in this, uh, uh, in this panel. And uh, the other uh, point I just wanted to make here is that this data is right skewed. You can see the means for the key variables are actually to the right of the, the media. So you've got presence of uh, uh, you know, outliers there some firms that are really significantly larger than the, the median firm. Okay, and then um, importantly, this implies that the model that I'll show very shortly, the estimate, estimating equation, 
is the one where we express you know the key variables as ratios of the uh, you know the the levels of capital is actually justified because uh, Shirinko actually argues that uh, you know where you have uh, extreme val extreme um, you know values in the same level data sets, it's best to actually get logs or get ratios okay, of uh, your parameters of interest um, uh, to you know to the, the, the assets basically weighting your parameters of interest by the by the assets okay so this is the estimating equation it's the prevailing equation in the literature even from the uh, you know early on uh, up to date so studies such as Gwenga, you know Simla, Shirinko and so on have actually used this particular model uh, so what we see here is just a representation of investment being a function of uh, investment in the prior year, as well as uh, the sales, changes in sales or sales growth, and the changes in the user cost of capital. For more details on how this uh, representation is actually derived and uh, arrived at, I would uh, refer you to pages 11 to 13 of the um, you know, the ESA working paper 863. Um, uh, but this is an equation that then I, I check to the data and um, I basically estimate this equation using both OLS as well as GMM. So OLS, I use it basically as a, you know, just a baseline estimation technique uh, because we cannot really use OLS as our final estimation technique because of uh, inherent biases that we might want to correct for, particularly given the, 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 the dynamic nature of our investment equation, OLS would be inherently biased because of the you know, Nicholson bias or the dynamic panel bias that would uh, come in if um, the lag of investment is not appropriately uh, you know, taken, uh, estimated. The correlation between the lag of investment and, um, and the error term has to be correctly uh, taken into account. Then obviously we have the standard uh, unobserved fixed effects, as well as the, in the literature, the specific literature on corporate tax and investment does state that uh, there's potential reverse causality actually between the user cost of capital and investment. It's possible that investment might actually uh, you know, influence uh, tax policy. Um, so because of, of these challenges, I actually also estimate uh, a GMM that uh, takes into account or addresses some of the econometric passes I've just highlighted. But it's crucial to, to point out that uh, GMM also does have its own problems. It's not, uh, it's not foolproof. Uh, GMM, as we all know, is very sensitive to specification, changes in the instrument set, uh, changes in the length of the uh, the, the instruments themselves, also just changes in estimation technique, whether you're using two step or one step, or whether you are using difference or system GMM, GMM tends to, to be quite sensitive. So it's not, uh, it's not a foolproof uh, technique. However, to address some of the uh, concerns that, you know, the very fact that GMM could be sensitive to specification, I do run a number of, uh, specification checks and robustness checks just to see how insensitive the results you know uh, would be so these are the the results of the models i just described uh, and i just highlight really the main results again for the full results that show even the uh, you know the the estimates on the different lags uh, i would refer uh, you to the working paper but the main, main results really are basically the coefficients on the lag of investment, uh, the, the long run coefficient on the user cost of capital, as well as the long run coefficient on output. Okay, and um, uh, I'll just go right straight away to the main results. So the main results are in the row where we've got user cost of capital. Um, the finding generally is that uh, in both the OLS and GMM. Firstly, the, the, the coefficient 
it has the expected sign. It's negative. Yeah, that's that's the expected direction, but it's not uh, it's not significant. And the, these results actually remain even when I you know uh, change uh, specifications of my GMM model. Um, even when I do various things that I'll talk about and various robustness uh, checks that I that I perform. Um, the the result on um, on output do show a positive result and within the expected range. And also the result on the lag of investment does show that you know past investment matters for for present investment or investment today matters for investment in the future. And uh, this also does uh, suggest to me that uh, in terms of the choice of the the, the the specification of my investment model as a dynamic or autoregressive model, the, the lag of investment does confirm that, you know, that specification is an appropriate one because it, uh, the lag is actually significant. So modeling investment, you know, as relying on its past lag is actually an appropriate uh, specification. And also the very fact that the lag is between the, the value of zero and one in absolute terms suggests that, you know, my model is actually dynamically stable. And I'll talk about the other uh, tests that I did. Uh, but in general, my findings suggest that, uh, uh, you know, there's no uh, significant relationship between corporate tax changes and firm level investment. Um, and this holds really, regardless of how I actually specify the model, regardless of the various sensitivity checks, I'll talk about very shortly. But this um, result is not really the only exception. There are other very recent papers uh, in South Africa, as well as uh, in the US and in Slovenia, that actually find now effects of corporate tax reforms with, I mean, studies that use a similar framework. Um, and the, you know, before I actually go on to, to look at the, some of the robustness checks and the implication of these results, I just want to go back to the results and highlight some of the, um, you know, specification checks that I, that I, I ran. So for the GMM model, we all know that uh, GMM is only really consist, consistent and uh, efficient when there's no serial correlation. So I ran the, the AR2 test by Arlano and Bond, and it does, it's actually, does show that uh, the, you don't have, uh, you know, serial correlation of the second order in the, in the residues. So I know that I don't have serial correlation, so that is okay. And then as for whether the instruments are valid or not, the, uh, the Saga and Hansen uh, statistic does show that the instruments are actually valid. So I, at least I get comfort in the fact that the, the GMM model itself is doesn't have specification problems. Uh, I mean, it's appropriate model to use in this case. And then also again, comfort in the fact that the estimation or the specification of the investment model as, um, as an autoregressive one is actually uh, okay, or is actually appropriate because I get a significant coefficient on the lag of investment. Specifically, we see that, you know, uh, investment in the last year predicts about a quarter of our investment in the, in the present year. Okay, so uh, the only, so the results seem okay. And uh, we also find that output or aggregate demand is, is significant. And this also remains robust across all the different models. Output is always significant. While, um, you know, corporate tax policy as estimated through the tax adjusted use of cost of capital is always uh, insignificant. And this seems to basically just suggest that at least for the case of South Africa and for the large firms in South Africa, we seem to have the you know, output really as the only determinant of investment using the neoclassical investment model. 
Okay, so what are some of the robustness checks I did? I did quite a number, but in this study, I just highlight uh, you know, two. So you will notice that the, my sample period 1999 to 2012 spans the 2009 financial crisis. So uh, I do a very simple check. It's, it's possible that uh, you know, the, the financial crisis might have dampened the effects of corporate tax policy in South Africa because my sample spans that period. So what I do is a very simple test to basically check whether the coefficient on the user cost of capital will change if I restrict my sample period to only the period just before the crisis. So I, I do a similar estimation, but just for the period 1999 to 2008, and the results actually do not change. I, I would have uh, had hoped that the results would change, but unfortunately, well, but the results remain the same. So meaning this, this means that uh, even before the financial crisis, corporate tax policy, at least for this particular subsample, you know, didn't materialize in more investments. Another plausible reason where I actually, you know, contribute uh, to the literature is also, you know, the consideration for attrition bias. Most of the studies in this literature do not really control for attrition bias. There are very few. There's actually, as a matter of fact, only one that I found, Gwenga uh, 2014. Uh, the full uh, working paper does show all the papers that I, you know, uh, I reviewed, and I actually found, found that they didn't control for attrition. So I, I controlled for attrition using the methodology in Woodridge uh, 2002, the textbook, as well as uh, in Dwenga 2014, where basically you control for attrition in a three-step process. Firstly, you, you know, predict the probability of dropping out of a sample. And then second stage, you estimate the, you know, inverse mills ratio. And then in the final stage, you, you know, include the inverse mills ratio in the, in the regression. And of course, bootstrap the, the coefficients to get, uh, to get co consistent, uh, you know, um, uh, standard errors, uh, unbiased standard errors rather. Uh, so I did that uh, to control for attrition bias. And the main reason is that if, if attrition is in any way correlated with um, uh, the decision to invest, let's say if attrition is correlated with uh, bankruptcy, you might, and you don't control for it, the, you know, the coefficients in, your, in the model will, will be biased. So, to, so we need to actually control for that. And I do that. But even when I do that, I actually do not find any, uh, any different results. The, the finding that the user cost of capital coefficient is insignificant still persists even when I control for all these things, uh, you know, for the financial crisis, control for attrition, and many other things. I, I actually also controlled for me possible measurement error in my user cost of capital coefficient. But I will not get into much detail there because of, uh, I think I'm running out of time. So what are the implications of these findings? So um, the finding that corporate tax, uh, you know, does not translate, corporate tax incentives do not positively impact uh, investment, at least at the firm level in the largest firms in South Africa, suggests that investment policy, current investment policy must actually look beyond, you know, uh, corporate tax incentives. Perhaps uh, policymakers must look at what's happening in the broader investment climate. This is more so given that recent studies do show that the investment climate uh, does matter. Well, recent World Bank surveys on doing business, you know, the ease of doing business in sub-Saharan and including in South Africa, do show that infrastructure does play a role in investment determination. Uh, there's also the issues around, um, you know, labor relations, smooth or better labor relations do matter, especially in the context of South Africa. And there are other um, broader investment climate factors like you know, the cost of doing business in South Africa. Some studies do find uh, financial constraints to be binding or to be important in determining investment. So um, it's important that um, you know, uh, you know, policy actually looks much more broader in terms of finding solutions to the investment challenges in uh, South African corporate firms. 
and uh, you know, begin to interrogate broader investment climate factors. Uh, in conclusion, uh, this study looked at the relationship between company or corporate tax policy and investment uh, using the neoclassical investment model of uh, Jackson. And uh, I actually, the study estimated uh, an autoregressive display lag model of investment in an effort to explain uh, the determinants of uh, investment. And uh, the main finding from this study is that you know, corporate tax policy does not have an impact in investment determination. However, output seems to, output or aggregate demand seems to be a consistent factor in firms' uh, um, decision to, to invest. And so uh, I, uh, this study actually calls for future studies to basically explore various things, including Firstly, the role of uh, the investment climate, specifically, you know, infrastructure issues, electricity in particular, uh, telecoms has been raised before, road network in certain rural areas and so on, agricultural investments, um, the role of labor relations, corruption, crime, all these factors that go into uh, the investment climate. I've come to the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much.